If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 25. That's where we're going to be this morning. And we are going to be talking about what it means to be faithful. So far, we've gone through some key attributes about what God wants for our life. He wants us to be authentic. He wants us to be truthful and transparent. Uh, he wants us to give grace to each other. And so these are, the, these are the things that we want to strive for, the values that we want to strive for. And really, when we talk about faithfulness, faithfulness has to do with being prepared and being in a trusting relationship with God. I don't know about you, but uh, I like to take trips. I like to go on vacations. We like to go to the beach. Um, we like to, you know, go up to an O's game. I mean, we do like to, to travel around, Angel and I. Um, but it's tough traveling with kids. I mean, it's kind of a nightmare, actually. Um, but, yeah, the last time that we, that we went anywhere, our kids did pretty good. I mean, they were in the car three hours, but they did a pretty good job. But I have always been an overpacker. Anybody else an overpacker when you go on trips? I've always been an overpacker. If I go for two nights, I'm preparing for five. Because, hey, you never know what could happen. Get wet, anything could happen. So why not have more than what you need? Any, any more, I'm just like, if it can't fit in my book bag, it's just, it's, it's not going. Okay? <laughs> I don't like to pack. I don't like to spend time on packing. But we will pack. <laughs> and when we go on a trip, it's with us because it's very fun. Uh, so, so we will entrust our children to people. And, and so we typically will leave our kids most of the time more with our parents, right? Angel's mom and dad, and they are wonderful people. When we had a dog, we trusted them with our dog. They took care of our dog. When now that we have kids, we leave our kids with them, and we entrust the most precious, important thing that we have to them, our kids. And that's what God is going to share with us this morning. God has entrusted the most important thing that he has, his people. And he's entrusted that to each other, to us as a church family. And so we're going to look at what it means to be prepared and faithful with what God has entrusted to us. If you read through Matthew chapter 25 and you look at the beginning passages of scripture, he starts off with this illustration, and it's an illustration about the ten versions, uh, the ten versions, yeah, ten different versions, ten virgins, that's my southern Ohio accent, okay, I am from the Buckeye State, and sometimes I either make up words when I'm here, or I just don't complete the words that I say, okay, so you have to bear with me, oh, that's terrible, but, but he gives us this idea of ten versions about having the right attitude, we are waiting we have a, a waiting type of attitude. What we're looking at is not just waiting, not just the right attitude, but working, doing the right thing. And so we're looking at what's called the parable of the talents, and we are looking at faith in action, or in other words, faithfulness. Now in verse 14, Jesus is teaching his disciples here, and he says, for it, some of your translations might have the kingdom of God, for it is like. Okay, um, they added the kingdom of God in there because that's what Jesus is talking about. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. And the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away. He dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. The first thing that we're looking at this morning is faithfulness recognized as entrustment. And verse 15, it said, God entrusted his possessions, his property, to them. To who? to the slaves, or some of your translations might have servants. Jesus left this world, he ascended into heaven after his resurrection, and he entrusted his divine property to his 12 apostles, who in turn trusted that property to those who are called prophets, elders, evangelists, teachers, deacons, and then and so on to servants, to ministers, people who don't have a church leadership position but are still followers of Jesus. God has entrusted his property to his people. That's what this parable is teaching. Now we notice this slave-master relationship. In the ancient world, it was a lot different than what many of us would think about what slavery is today. We think of southern 1800, 1700 slavery, um, which people were forcibly in, pushed into slavery, right? They didn't really have an option. 
That's not how the ancient world worked. Whenever you really talked about slavery, people would often sell themselves into slavery and be basically a hired hand by their master. Um, They could have a good job. They could have good talents and good abilities, but they could be struggling with finding money, finding jobs, making ends meet. And so they would sell themselves into slavery, and they would live according to their master. They'd live in the same home. They'd eat the same food. It was actually a fairly decent relationship. Now, people abused that relationship, but ancient slavery, more often than not, was not like modern slavery that we know and experience today. And so people could be administrators, they could be clothing makers, money handlers, musicians, actors, laborers. And they were like, look, I need a job. i got to provide for my family. I'm going to entrust my, my service. I'm going to enslave myself for money so that I can be taken care of to this master. And so when we talk about this ancient world, that's the kind of idea that we need to have. And Jesus uses this type of parable to teach us. He calls it his own slaves or his own servants. These are people like you and I who have made the willful decision to entrust ourselves to the master. And so when we look at our faithfulness, we are not talking about something that we haven't signed up for. We're not talking about something that we haven't committed to. When we decided to become a Christian and we enslaved ourselves to the king, we sold ourselves to the master, Jesus, we were willing to follow him wherever he told us to go. We were willing to do whatever he told us to do and be whomever he told us to be. That's the decision that we made. We are his property. And so when Jesus entrusted this to us at his ascension, he is giving us a certain amount of responsibility according to our ability. And so if a key phrase that we could focus in on this morning, it would be this. Faithfulness means holding oneself accountable to the terms previously agreed upon. As a Christian, we agreed to this. We signed up for this. And so have these servants in the parable. Now look what it says in verse 15. To one he gave five, to another he gave two, to another he gave one. So we do notice that this entrustment comes at a varying degree of God's choosing. God looks at a person's ability and he says, I'm going to entrust you with a certain amount of responsibility. Now just because we're different in function does not mean we are not equal with value. Are you with me? Just because certain people have certain amounts of responsibility, some more than others, does not mean that one person is more valuable than the other. That's very, very important. My job up here on Sunday morning is no more important than the person who cleans the bathrooms, or the person who teaches our kids, or the person who prepares prepares communion in the back. We are all equal in value, but different in function. It's very, very important because sometimes we can be arrogant and prideful and we can think that this is all about us when a church family says this is all about each other. And so the same thing, it's like this, husbands and wives. Husband, women and men are not equal in function, but they are certainly equal in value. We were created to be different. And men who try to be like women and women who try to be like men, it just doesn't work. Why? Because we are biologically different. That's how we were created. And so it's the same thing with servants in the church. We are different, but we are equal in value. And so the person who has five is equal to the person who has two, is equal to the person who has one. That's what Jesus is teaching. And so if we look at what was entrusted to them, the parable is using money. Now, we don't exactly know how much money it was, but certain scholars have calculated one talent would equal about 16 years of work. Now, think about that for a moment. 16 years of work was entrusted to the person with one talent. Now, if you're not good at math, the person who has, like me, I'm like, use my phone. What's 2 plus 2 equals 4? That's what I do. I enter it in my phone. Okay, I'm terrible at math. That's why I preach. Uh, I'm not very good at English either, but hey, who cares? So two talents to the two-talent man was 32 years, and then five talents was about 82 years. We're talking about a lifetime's worth of money was entrusted to this individual who had the five talents. And that's what God gave to him. So we're, we're not talking about just a little few things like, hey, you know, watch my dog, okay? We're talking about something that is very, very valuable, very, very important, something like your kids. And so Jesus uses money for the sake of the illustration. And I'd like to point out this. Jesus' entrustment comes at a different quantity to the different individuals. 
Some are entrusted with more. That's simply how it is. And so a true church family will celebrate diversity. We will celebrate our differences because we are more concerned about getting things right with God as a group rather than getting things right for ourselves. We don't look at different people in the church and say, hey, man, that person's got more. I, wanna, I want what they have. We should celebrate where each other is and what each other has and not grow jealous and envious but work together as a group. That's what a church family does. And so faithfulness is not disconnected from community. They are working together. If I could put it in a simple phrase, I would say this. Faithfulness recognizes that God entrusted not just the quality of his property, the people of his kingdom, but the quantity of his property, multiple disciples. And I'm glad Jesus used three different people for this illustration. Because here's why. Our tendency is to put one person in charge of everything. I mean, after all, it it is kind of successful, isn't it? You look at a successful organization, who's usually at the top? The CEO. But what you don't see behind the scenes are the group of people holding the CEO accountable. And dude, this happens in the church all the time. People refer to me as the preacher. Let's get something very, very clear. I am not the preacher of the church. I am a preacher of the church, and I've been delegated with the responsibility to preach on Sunday mornings. I am not more important than anybody else, not more important than Kyle, our youth minister, or Clyde, who's another evangelist on staff, or our elders, or our teachers. This is just the function that I have. And so you enter very dangerous territory in the church when you start making everything a hierarchy, When you start putting a pope or a priest or somebody who says, I'm standing in the place of Jesus Christ and I'm here to represent on behalf of him. And so follow me. No, we need to operate in plurality. We need to have multiple apostles, multiple disciples, multiple ministers. Because we cannot allow one person to rise to the top and be in charge of everything. And so while we may be different in function, we may be different in authority, it is absolutely essential that we operate in plurality. Being together makes things better. That's the idea and the nature of the kingdom. So it's not just the quality of his people, but the quantity of his property. Now look what he says, he goes on to say in verse 15. He entrusted this according to his ability. So here's the thing, guys. You may be responsible for teaching a class, or preparing communion, or doing a devotion, or leading a life group, or whatever. The question shouldn't be what you've been entrusted with. The question should be, are you faithful with what you've been entrusted with? Are you responsible? Do you take care of the small things? I had a football coach who put it like this. If you take care of the small things, the big things will take care of themselves. When God's entrusted you with his money, blessed you with a job, are you faithful in that? When God's blessed you with a husband or a wife, are you faithful in that marriage? When God has blessed you with kids, are you faithful with that? When God has blessed you with a house or with property, are you faithful with that? And here's how you know you're faithful with that. Do you use it to the glory of God? You see, that's the danger that we're going to be looking at. The danger of the faithless servant, is that he started to view things as his own. This is mine. This isn't God's. And so the question this morning is this. Even though we might have a different ability, are you faithful with what's been entrusted to you? John Wooden, one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, he put it like this. He says, others may have more ability than you. They may be larger and faster and quicker and better jumpers. But no one should be superior in respect to the team spirit, loyalty, enthusiasm, cooperation, determination, industriousness, fight, effort, and character. So even though we might be different in our our abilities, the question is, do you go at what God has entrusted to you with a certain tenacity and determination and faithfulness? Do you take care of what God has already given you? We should focus on the faithfulness of what we do have and not what we don't have. And this is the kind of thinking that will lead to immediate action. Look at what happened in verse 16. When God gave them something, look what they did. Immediately the one who received the five talents, immediately the one who received the two, and the one who received the one, what did they do with it? Well, the first two, they traded and they gained more. You see, true faithfulness is acting. 
A faith that saves is a faith that works. And if we don't do anything with what God has entrusted us with, how can we claim that we have saving faith? How can we claim that we are faithful to God? If we aren't using our homes and our money and our time and our talents and our abilities for the glory of God, if we aren't being faithful with those things, can we honestly claim that we have a faith that saves? James put it like this in James chapter 2. You can read it on your own time. But he says, you show me your faith by what you don't do, and I'll show you my faith But what I do do. I'll show you my faith by my works. And he goes on to say, faith without works is dead. In other words, it's not saving faith. And so the people who have immediately responded to the entrustment of God, they acted in faith. Harold Fowler puts it like this, our ability to work now determines our qualification to rule later. And so what you do with what you have absolutely matters. Because the impact of your decisions now are going to impact the decisions later. And I'm not just talking about later on in your life, I'm talking about later on in eternity. He goes on to say in verse 18, he looks at this this one talent man and look what he did. He who received one talent went away and he dug a hole and he buried it. There are two kinds of faithless servants. Those who are in active disobedience to God and those who are lazy and uninvolved. He's unconfident. He's uninvolved. He's not committed. He sits on the sidelines while everyone else is in the game. In the ancient days, especially in times of war, um, putting your money out there would be a risky thing. You could possibly lose it, right? And so what this guy does is it's not a time of war. He just takes his money and he buries it in the ground. Not because there's not opportunity. Not because he lacks ability. God entrusted to him one talent. He had ability. But because he was lazy and he was wicked. And so he tried to pick a safe place to bury his money. So what's the problem? What's the issue here with this one talent man? The issue is this. It was his master's money given to him to invest, not to bury. It was given to him to invest, not to bury. And so what God has entrusted him with was to be determined on God's terms, not his own. Do you see the problem? He starts to think, well, I need to worry about me. I'm not going to be worried about God's business. As if what he had actually belonged to him anyway. Oh, I'll let God's business do its thing, but I'll come over here and take care of my own. The Bible says everything is the Lord's. The cattle on a thousand hill are the Lord's. Your job is the Lord's. Your money, your house, your time, your talents, your abilities. Everything is God's. It's not God's stuff and my stuff. It's God's stuff. Now, what am I going to do with it? Now, he was delegated with this specific task to entrust it in such a way that would bring results, and yet he buried it in the ground. He was overly cautious, and he thought that this was a wise thing, but in reality, he breached God's trust because he was too lazy to do anything with it. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to sit on the sidelines. Now, look, I get what it's like having too many options, and you just don't know what to choose. Angel sent me to the store to get shampoo. I was there for 35 minutes. (laughs) 35 minutes. I'm like, I'm trying to call her. And of course, Walmart's like a dead zone. I mean, you can't even get a phone call. She's like, send me a picture. So I said, tried to send her a picture and it's not sending through. And I'm sweating and I'm like, you told me to get this Tresemme brand or however you call it. There's 15 different kinds. What am I supposed to do here? Oh, well, here's what you do. You get the kind that says it's like for heat and it helps and it's got like this proactive antibiotics. And I'm like, what? Antibiotics and shampoo? That doesn't even make sense. I'm like, where's the all-in-one body wash, you know? As long as I wash here to here, I'm good. That's all I need. And so, of course, what do I do? She entrusts me to go get shampoo, and I come back with the wrong stuff. And I'm just like, I can't, I can't win for losing. You know what I'm saying? I hate going shopping for feminine products. It drives me nuts. And you men know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you go to any female aisle, and there are literally 20 different choices. And so sometimes I kind of get a little overwhelmed, and I'm like, I can't do this. I can't get this shampoo. It's too stressful. And so I'm just like, look, you're going to have to go out and get it, honey. I'm sorry. (laughs) I get that. But he had a very clear-cut case. Here's what you should do. There weren't a thousand different options. He should have traded it at the market, just like everyone else. And that's how it is with God's stuff. We know what we should do on God's behalf. That's not the question. The question is whether or not we're doing it whether or not we are being faithful. 
And so God has entrusted his property to his disciples, to us, and ultimately the lazy servant had the wrong motivation. It was more about him rather than the father. And as Christians today, we need to ask ourselves, what has God entrusted to me and what am I doing with it? What has God entrusted to me and what am I doing with it? I really want you to think about that for a moment. What do you have that you know God has given to you and are you using it for his glory? Are you using it for his gain? You see, these servants knew what to do. Why? Because they were faithful to the person of Jesus. He was Lord. He is master. And that's the difference between the faithful and the faithless. And so naturally, when we recognize who the master is, we will obey. And so the second thing that we're going to look at is this. Faithfulness recognizes God's entitlement. God is worthy. He deserves it all. He doesn't deserve just a small portion. God deserves it all. Look what it goes on to say here in Matthew 25. Excuse me. It says in verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents saying, Master, you have entrusted the five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And also the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master... You entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping what you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. And so this long journey that the master was on is the the death and ascension of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, the previous parable that I gave you was about the ten virgins, about waiting, having the right attitude. Now I'm going to talk to you about working, doing the right thing. You see, here's the danger. And this is what the church at uh, the church of Thessalon- Thessalonica, say that five times really fast if you can. I always mess it up. I knew I was going to today. But anyways, the Thessalonians, <laughs> that's easier, uh, First Thessalonians. So you can read it in your Bible. But anyways, they had this strong problem. They were so concerned about the second coming that they grew lazy and idle and they didn't do a thing. And so Paul had to write Second Thessalonians to tell them, hey, look, don't let the return of the Messiah, overcome the work that you should be doing. You still should be serving. You still should be doing. And so what is going on here? He's saying, look, don't let the idea of waiting overcome the idea of working. You've got to have a balance. You've got to do both, the right attitude and the right action. And so this long time represents when Christ is away. But look at what it says in verse 19. It says, he returns. And after a long time, this gracious king comes to settle the accounts. Judgment day, in other words. He gives us enough time to do the right thing. A long journey, not a little quick journey. And I've experienced that. God is so patient with me. Look, guys, we would be up here all day if I went through the things that I dropped the ball on or was faithless with. I certainly have not always been perfect, and I certainly would not consider myself a five-talent man, okay? But the reality is this. Jesus will come back. And every single person in this room will stand before his throne to give an account for what we have done with his property and with his time. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Is that a scary thought? It shouldn't be. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 7 says, just as a man is appointed to die once and after that to to face judgment. There is no second chance. Once you die, that's it. And so when you pass away from this life and you look back at how you lived and how you worked, can you honestly say, I was faithful with what God gave to me. I was more concerned about the group rather than myself and I lived in such a way that gave God the glory with everything that I have. 
In verse 20, look what we find. The five-talent man and the two-talent man, they were faithful. And this idea here in verse 20, they're literally saying, look here, master. Look here, I want to show you what I've done. I love it when Piper comes up and she is so proud of herself whenever she does something that, that she knows is good and she will show me and I will give her a big hug and a big kiss and she is so excited to come see me and she'll go, look, 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 dad, look. And I'll see it and I'll be like, wow, Piper, great job. Whether it's picking up something off of the floor and putting it in her cup or whatever. One of the best things my little girl loves to do is to share her, her food with me. And I love it, of course. It's great. And so she'll go, bite, bite, daddy, bite. And I'll come over and I'll take even a small bite. And she'll get so excited and I'll give her a big hug. And I'll say, man, you did such a great job. That's the kind of attitude that we should have when it comes to our faithfulness. Do you have that kind of attitude? Are you saying, God, look. Look, God, what I've done with what you've entrusted to me. I was faithful. Look, master, and see. I think one of the reasons why we're afraid and we fear is because we can identify with the one servant man in some ways. And we're going to get into this in just a few minutes. But he had the wrong perspective of God, which led to the wrong action. He was afraid and he was fearful. You're not allowed to look at the clock. I saw some of you just do that. You're like, man, he's on poo. He's saying here in a couple minutes he's already gone for 30. <laughs> look, I'm not going to go over an hour today, okay? I promise. But we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so these two servants have joyous, unshaken excitement to share with the Lord. Are you excited to share with God what you have done? It's not a bad thing to say, look, master, here I am to share with you. It is his money, his time, his people. And look at what, look at what God wants to share with us. Welcome into my joy. Do you think God wants to reprimand the faithless? Absolutely not. He's entrusted with you in such a way that he wants to welcome you into his joy. The point isn't eternal separation. The point is eternal enjoyment. Are you faithful? At the end of the day, we should have joy when we look on what we have done and what we're going to do. When Paul looked at his ministry, he, he said this in 1 Thessalonians. He says in chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, he says, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes? Where's our joy? Where's our celebration? He says, Indeed, you at the church, you people, you are our glory and you are our joy. Yeah, you might stand before God with a big house, a great business, wonderful clothes, cool jewelry, a great collection of things, but all of those things will be burned away. And at the end of the day, you're going to be looking at people. You're going to be looking at each other. All of those things are going to be gone. Are you going to have joy with the master? Are you going to stand before God and say, look, master, look at the people that I have impacted through teaching a kid's class, through serving at the Welcome Center, through making sure the building is clean, through preparing the Lord's Supper, through being a part of a missions, through serving in a ministry. Look, Master, let's celebrate and have joy together. Man, it would stink if you were before God and you were alone and you couldn't point to your children, your parents, your friends, and you couldn't say, look at the joy that we have through the impact of each other. You see, that's what's at stake here. And the master certainly responds, well done, good and faithful. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you faithful over much. And so a key point would simply be this. God wants to share his happiness with you, but the condition is faithfulness. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. We must believe in and we must believe that. We must believe facts, and those facts must lead to action of trust. Now look at verse 24. Look what this guy does. And we are, we are ending, believe it or not, with him. And he says in verse 24, Master, this one talent man comes in, who buried it in the ground. He says, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you scattered no seed. Think about this. Think about standing before God and say, hey, God, I'm not the problem. <clears throat> You're the problem. I talked to a guy this last week who was teaching the gospel, and he was so upset. He goes, you know, why are you beating up on my family? I'm like, look, dude, I'm not beating up on anybody's family. I'm simply reading what the Bible says. And he says, well, if I stood before God and he did that, I'd tell him he made a mistake. I was like, listen to yourself. Listen to what you're saying. 
Do you trust that God will do the right thing? Do you trust that God will do the just thing concerning your family who are no longer here? How could we have the audacity to look at God and say, God, you are the problem. You made the mistake. And that's exactly what this wicked servant does. He says, you were, I knew you were a hard man. I knew you were a hard man. You were merciless, indifferent. You were harsh. You see, he's got the wrong view of God because of his own internal sin problem. He says, I knew you were the kind of man that reaped where you scattered no seed. You see, he's got no real motivation here to labor because any potential return that he gets isn't about what benefits the the master, God. It's about what benefits me. And because there's nothing in it for me, I'm not putting any money, effort, time into it. Now, wow, did that hit me like a load of bricks between the eyeballs, right? Think about that for a second. Do we approach the things of God as if we expect a return ourselves? Do we do God's work saying, man, where's my cut? I didn't get anything out of church this morning. Oh, well, I don't really like that music, so I'm not going to sing it. Oh, well, that ministry event isn't something I want to participate in. Well, I don't necessarily agree with where the money's being spent, so I'm not going to give. Well, I don't like this. There's nothing in it for me. I don't like that class. Not for me, not for me. It is so egocentric, it makes God sick to his stomach. When did being a servant of God that we entrusted ourselves to ever become about us? That's the problem of the wicked slave is he says, it is about me, what's in it for me? And he didn't love the master enough to act on his behalf. And so he had the wrong motivation, he had the wrong perception about God, and he ultimately had the wrong action. A true church family is outward focused. If we start asking questions, what's in it for us, we have missed the mark of the kingdom of God. Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and make sure you play music and do church the way Christians want. That's not what he said. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. We cannot approach church as if what's in it for us, because that is completely contrary to the gospel. You see, this servant not only viewed God as the problem, but he ultimately puts blame on God. Pointed his finger and says, I knew this about you, when really it was about him. He failed to take responsibility. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. When things don't go your way, what's your response? Do you put blame on other people? When your marriage isn't working, do you point your finger and say, well, you, when you're struggling in your family life and your kids aren't obeying, do you say, well, you, when your job stinks and you can't stand where you work, do you say, well, them, everybody else has the blame, or do you stand up and take responsibility and say, what can I do to make a difference and a change? And that's true in the church. Look, if there's something that you might not agree with here, the question isn't, somebody needs to go out there and fix it. The action is, what can I do to bring about the change for the glory of God? That's the kind of attitude that God wants us to have. Last week, I was a moron, and I backed my truck up into a metal pole. Didn't even see it. I have one of those really cool cameras, and I am abusing it because I don't even look in my mirrors anymore. I just look at my camera. Nothing's there. Let's go. And so it was awful, okay? I'm like, man, how stupid could I possibly get? So I backed up. So my camera angle was just far enough down to where this pole hung out just far enough, and I didn't see it. And so it hit right above my camera. And I'm like, man, I do not want to tell Angel that I just backed up my truck into a pole. It's $500 deductible. I don't have $500 to spend on a truck. Drives me nuts. So I get home, and I sit down. Angel's very nice. We were working outside. She brings me water and say, honey, got some bad news for you. And he's just like, <gasps> you know, kind of overreacting a little bit. But uh, it was bad news. So I'm like, hey, I, uh, I backed up my truck into a pole. I'm really sorry. And she just looks at me and keeps her mouth, you know, shut because she knows I'm a moron. And she's just like, <sighs> She walks back inside. I'm like, ah, I got it over with. You know what I mean? I manned up in that moment. I didn't hide it. How could I hide? Like, what am I going to do? Wait for her to see it? You know what I'm saying? Like, we can't hide behind anything in the eyes of God. We will stand before the judgment seat. And we do really stupid things. Don't conceal it. Don't hide it. 
take responsibility. Stand up and say, if it's your fault, yes, it is my fault. I will take responsibility. I will help move this church forward. You see, a church family that takes responsibility will grow. A church family that takes responsibility will be successful. A church family that takes responsibility will learn from their mistakes and will keep moving forward. And I'm not just talking about church leadership. I'm talking about everybody in this room. Because if you don't have responsibility, if you're not taking responsibility for what we do as a church, we have a problem. Professor and Pulitzer Prize winner, he's a winning journalist, William Raspberry said this, if you want to be thought of as a solid, reliable pillar in your community when you were 50, you cannot be an irresponsible, corner-cutting exploiter at 25. The time to worry about your reputation is before you have one. You determine your reputation by deciding who and what you are and by keeping that lofty vision of yourself in mind, even when you're having a rip-roaring good time. Simply put is this, if you want to be thought as a responsible person in the next life, we've got to be a responsible person in this one. If you want to be entrusted with the eternal joy of God, you better be responsible with the joy given to you in this life. The problem wasn't with the talent, the problem wasn't with the master, the problem was with the internal character of the lazy servant. John Maxwell put it like this, outside reputation will never exceed that if inside of inside character. And if we want to be faithful, we've got to grow on the inside too. And notice what he says. He says, I was afraid. I was afraid. He had the wrong idea about God. He had the wrong action towards God. And even his emotions got in the way. And boy, isn't that true in church? Isn't that true in your own personal life? Emotions step in, get in the way, muddy all the facts. He says, I was afraid, I was fearful. And guess what? This was probably genuine. This was probably absolutely spot on. But we've got to check our feelings. We've got to check how we feel about stuff because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And just because it feels right doesn't mean it is right. And so he led his fear to cause him to be inactive. And we can do that same, that same thing. We can allow our emotions to inactivate our service before God and we make excuses. If only I had more money, more time, a better job, whatever. And he allowed the fear of his mistakes, which was something that was absolutely wrong, he allowed the fear of his mistakes to cause him to be inactive, which was the greatest mistake of all. My personality is even though I might not have everything figured out, let's go do it and we'll learn along the way. I err sometimes on the side of not being prepared or not thinking things through. And that's not okay either. But at the same time, we can't allow the overwhelming nature of the, of the glory and kingdom of God to cause us to be inactive. Figure it out, in other words. Get it figured out. His fear failed him. And here's the, here's, the, here's the worst part. He failed to realize that his present service was preparation for greater things to come. And we can't lose that as a church. You can't lose that as a Christian. What you are doing right now is preparation for greater things to come. Don't rob yourself of the future joy by your present fear. Don't fear and have this false view of God that he's this harsh slave ready to drive you in the ground, ready to crack the whip if you make a mistake. God is for you. He wants you to share in his joy. God is for our faithfulness. He wants you to welcome uh, him into your life, and he wants you to be welcomed into his eternal joy. And at the end of this, he says, look, in verse 26, here's your money. I haven't lost it. I haven't squandered it. In other words, I still showed up to church every Sunday. In other words, I still gave my tithe every Sunday. Do you see the bare minimum basic mentality that the one talent man has? I did the bare minimum. I buried it in the ground. We can't be a church that does the bare minimum. He deceived himself. He tried to justify himself. And the question that I have for you this morning is this. What will be your excuse? What will be your excuse on the day of judgment when you stand before God and he says, what did you do with what I gave to you? The excuse that you have today will be the excuse that you have on Judgment Day. And so let's change if we're struggling with our faithfulness. Let's be different. Let's be like the five-talent man, the two-talent man, who hears the parable and immediately makes a change. Your change can start today. It's simply up to you. And so at the end of the day, his, faithful, his faithless slave 
took what God had entrusted to him and did nothing with it because ultimately he didn't view God as entitled to what he was owed. He didn't view God as somebody entitled for his service. And if you don't recognize the entitlement of God, you'll fail to understand his expectations. Matthew chapter 25, verses 26 and 30 says this. But his master answered him and said, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew that I had reaped where I did not sow and gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out that worthless slave into the outer darkness, and that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's wicked, he's lazy, he's ignorant, and he's foolish. That's the characteristic of a one-talent man who doesn't take what God has entrusted to him and multiplies it for his glory. And I don't want to be like that. And so today, we are challenged with two things. Running away from faithlessness and running toward faithfulness. Not being idle. Not being consumed with ourselves or interested in what we have going on. But being consumed with what God's business is. We literally are called to buy up the opportunities presented before us. And so today I leave you simply with a challenge. Don't waste your opportunity. Don't waste your opportunity that God has laid before you to use what God has given you for his glory. Whether it's talent, time, money, resources, encouragement, giving, whatever it is. 